but don't do things that we do until you understand it and you can say, I think I'm in, okay? Because again, that's why we want to take time. We do this for a couple reasons. One of the things that you, we're going to say over and over again about being Catholic um, is that it's intensely sensual. Because of how we're made, which is to say that we're not just spirits, we're bodies. In fact, in Hebrew, there is no word, the word that's used to describe the human person um, is a word that combines body and spirit into one, the word's nefesh. The, most of us, not knowing it perhaps, but we're, we're deeply shaped by kind of Greek philosophy and thinking, which sees um, uh, a split between matter and spirit. So some of us are old enough to remember the police, remember the song Ghost in the Machine, or the album Ghost in the Machine, We Are Spirits in an Invisible World. Um, that's not a Christian way of thinking. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a spirit trapped in a body. We actually believe in the resurrection of the body. In heaven, we will have bodies, glorified bodies. What that will be like, I don't have a clue. But we're not going to be floating spirits, you know, just kind of like these amoebas randomly bumping into each other on a microscopic, you know, film. So because of the fact that we are intensely bodily, what we do with our bodies matters, including when we worship. So just think of everyday experience. You know, somebody you meet, you shake their hand, right? It's a way of expressing, hi, welcome. And it's appropriate because that's how we're made, you know? Um, high five at a football game, um, a hug, uh, a kiss, um, whatever the gesture might be, we express ourselves that way. So in a certain sense, we would say that um, the body is the sacrament of the person. We'll talk about sacraments a long time from now, but what that basically means is you see, you learn something about who I am by what I do. Does that make sense? So we express ourselves with our bodies. A man gets down on his knees and proposes to the woman he wants to marry. We don't think, well, that's stupid. We think, no, oh, that's actually really beautiful. Why? Because it's a gesture with, with a posture that says, I'm inviting you into this relationship, into this covenant. Okay, so we would say that's an appropriate gesture. So the same kind of reasoning goes into play when we think about church, that our bo what we do with our bodies matters. And so we express ourselves bodily. That's the reason behind the gestures, but this is one of them. So we use our bodies to make what for us as Christians um, is now a symbol which has become... Unless you live in the Middle East, it's lost its shock value. But we've turned that into a beautiful piece of jewelry. But that's not a beautiful piece of jewelry. That's a horrific method of execution, which Jesus embraced as a way to display God's love. And so we sign ourselves as Catholics with the sign of the cross because the, the cross is the instrument with which Jesus conquered hell and routed Satan and made possible our salvation. Even in things like the Old Testament, so some of us who know scripture, this might be familiar, others of us, it's okay, we'll get to it later. In a um, we'll talk about this next week when we talk a little bit about an event in the Old Testament which is central, which helps us understand the Mass. But the, the Jewish people at a particular time in their history when God was breaking into their lives powerfully were instructed by God to make a sign on their doorposts with blood, animal blood. And the sign, by the time it was done being made, would look an awful lot like a cross 
on the threshold of their houses. That's actually something that helps us understand this. I, I do this on the front of my body to show that this person is claimed by the cross of Jesus. And he's my Lord. Okay? I'll tell you a quick story on that. Um, I have a friend of mine who was, um, used to do some work in Saudi Arabia where it's forbidden to practice Christianity, except for this one little, you know, uh, American enclave which they allow, but you cannot build a church in Saudi Arabia. And so those who live there, who are native there, um, cannot openly practice the faith. And so he was involved in doing some expatriate work over there, and he, he would come in every couple of months, and they would smuggle priests into the country. So they'd get a priest in every four or five months. And the priest would come in, and when he came, um, they would have baptisms, weddings, uh, mass, confessions. And because of the fact that they were watched, uh, they had to do it all clandestinely. And so there would be signs to tip people off. So this guy would drive the priest. That was his responsibility. And so he'd be driving. through the town or whatnot, he'd have one guy in his car, another guy'd have another guy in his car. And in, there would be lookouts. And you know, maybe the sign was a guy on a phone on a corner. The guy had his phone on the corner that meant keep going, they know you're here. Or if the guy didn't have his phone up, it meant we're safe, we can get together. And then if it was safe, they would get together and they would celebrate mass. So this guy was at an event one time, and there was a guy there who didn't have a right hand. And so he asked him, he says, uh, can I ask what happened? And the guy smiled at him, he says, yeah, I, uh, I lost my hand. And then he says, actually it was taken from me. And he says, what happened? And he says, well, I was reported for having publicly done this to the police. And they arrested him, brought him down to the police station, and said, you were seen publicly making the sign of the cross. So either tell us that you will never do that again, or we will make it so that you cannot. And the man went, and he lost his hand. I try to think of him every time I do this. So our gestures, though we might take them for granted, are done by brothers and sisters in other parts of the world where, trust me, they do not take them for granted. And they may actually end up on one of those. Answered in what I'm about to do. I want to show you how a Catholic would walk into a Catholic church. And in the process of doing that, show you why we do the gestures that we do and, and try to explain it. Okay, so some of them are things that we just asked. So, no one asked about holy water fonts. But, so imagine you're watching, you're observing somebody come into church. I'm going to give you... A, how many people have never seen Saving Private Ryan? Okay, one, two, three. Saving Private Ryan is a, um, a movie which is actually based on a true story of a man who's um, in, um, he's landed at Normandy. He's one of four brothers. His three brothers have all died in the middle of World War II. And so the War Department tries to rescue the last brother so that the mother doesn't lose all of her children. And it actually is a true story, although it's embellished like crazy in the movie. So um, the movie is the, de the description in a really powerful way of uh, this man being rescued. And it begins and it ends um, in modern times. So it begins with um, this man who was a World War II vet, 
who's now in his 80s, because it was 20 years old, um, going with his wife and his children and his grandchildren to Normandy in France, so to the place where they all landed on June 6, 1944. And so the movie begins with him kind of, you know, he's, he's an older guy, he's shuffling along, and he's on this path. All you can see is the path, and it's following him, and his family's kind of behind him, walking with him. And then all of a sudden, he gets to a certain spot, and he turns, and he looks out, and he's in the, the threshold, if you will, of the cemetery. And if you've ever seen Normandy, if you've ever been there, if you've ever seen pictures, it's just row after row after row of graves. Um, most of which are crosses, some of which are stars of David. So for the Jewish brothers and sisters and the Christians who died there. And so he gets to this place. He, he, he clearly turns, sees this whole field of graves, and then he starts looking. And then he just starts walking very intentionally towards a particular grave. And he gets to the grave, which is a cross, and he's staring at it, and the camera zooms into his eyes, and then it pulls out, and, and all of a sudden it's Normandy, 1944. And the rest of the movie is how he gets rescued, and then it ends with him back at the grave, talking to the grave, the man who it turns out, saved his life. I say that to you because um, I can't encourage you. I, we actually have this scene on one of our uh, videos. You can find it easily, I think, on our website. So if you go to the rerouting tab on our website, which was a series we did last year, it's week three of rerouting. It's entitled Emergency Vehicle Entrance. Don't ask why. And uh, there's a clip of this scene. I still think it's the best visual I can offer you of how you should walk into Mass. Because the man walks into this area. If you've ever gone to Normandy, like when you get to this point where he starts looking at the graves, like people don't walk into Normandy going, wow, look at this, this is so cool, how neat. Yeah, they're not gabbing. As soon as they walk in, it's like this hush comes over everybody. And they talk really lowly to each other. Because these people here, they were there and they died. And so there's this amazing reverential way about people. A hush comes over them. And usually people who go there, often people who go there, are going to visit particular graves. That's what this guy was doing that day. So if you were to walk into church, here's how I would suggest you walk in. So right in here, there's one of these. Now, I don't mean this flippantly, but it's true. This might be one of the least sanitary things in the entire building, okay? It's a bowl of water, um, which has been blessed. Um, and... So you would typically walk in, and the first thing you would do, so it's holy water. It's the water that we baptize ourselves or are baptized with. And we would typically say, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, as we come into the building itself. Why? A couple reasons. One, it immediately reminds me of my baptism. And in being reminded of my baptism, it reminds me of my identity. Who am I? Well, I'm a, I'm a son an adopted son of God, the one who made everything. And even as I do this, I'm reminded of his love for me, which is displayed on the cross. But I'm also reminded, like since the last time I was in church, ooh, I haven't always acted like his son or like his daughter. And so it immediately just, it's a powerful way because it's tangible, right? It's water, I can feel it. Right? It's wet. And so it has a, um, a sensual way, again, of just bringing to mind who I am, which oftentimes, because we live out in the middle of this culture and all the different ways that it assaults us and tries to offer us all these other identities, 
It's, it's a stark reminder to me. So that's the first thing that a Catholic would do. So enter the door, make the sign of the cross with holy water, and then just like Private Ryan, when Ryan gets in to this cemetery, his eyes are glued to a particular cross because that cross is the grave of the man who offered up his life so that Ryan could still be living. That's, that's how it is that Ryan's alive, if you've seen the movie. He's alive because this guy, Captain James Miller, died saving Ryan. And Ryan never forgets it. He's, he says as much at one point in the movie at the end when he says, I have thought about what you said to me every single day of my life. So with him, here, here's, here's the point. As we walk in, it's almost like we're walking into Normandy, except it's much more powerful than Normandy. And so you walk in, and just like that hush comes across him because he realizes this is not a living room, it's not a mall, it's not an auditorium. It's a place where we've come to worship the one who's laid down his life so that we can live. Not just for like another 10 years, forever. And so just like his eyes go to that one cross, our eyes go right up there. And it's almost like as soon as you, you just transfixed, it's like, here I am. And I'm, I'm alive again today, and I have hope again today, and there's mercy for me again today because of you and of what you've done. So we're just staring at the Lord. Okay? Does that visual make some sense? And I understand some of us, I still don't even know that Jesus is real. So much like I said last week, if that's true for us, we just want to say, Lord, if that's real, if you've done that for me, <laughs> and, and that means that I matter that much to the one who created everything that is, this universe that's 46 billion light years across and ever expanding, if it could possibly be true that I matter so much to you who made this that I want to know that. So I'm inviting you into my life. And then the, the last thing that a, a person would do, a Catholic would do before they sit down are two gestures. They bow to the altar. Okay? Who asked what we bow to? Yeah. So we bow to the altar. Why? Anybody ever been to Mexico? Anybody ever seen Aztec ruins? So go to outside Mexico City, you see the pyramids, Pyramid of the Sun, Pyramid of the Moon, right? So on these pyramids, there are altars. What happens on an altar? Now, things die, right? So you don't have an altar in your house. This is not a table. This is an altar. God doesn't die here. We'll talk about that next week. Jesus has died once and for all. Catholics know the Bible. We actually gave it to the world. We're familiar with that passage in Hebrews. And we wrote it. But the sacrifice that Jesus offered on the cross, we will hold, actually becomes present again in what we would call a sacramental way on that altar. So we bow to that altar because it's a way of saying, okay, this is where something really remarkable happens. Like that becomes contemporary to us now. And so that's what we do. We, we bow to the altar. When the priest comes in, he actually kisses the altar. So you see us come in. So me and Deacon Vince this morning, we come in. And the words I say when I kiss the altar are the altar is Christ. So Christ is the priest, he is the altar, he is the sacrifice, he's all those things. But so we just kiss it, and I always say the altar is Christ. It's a way of reminding me what this is and what will happen here for us. Okay, does that make sense? So you bow to the altar. The last thing you do before you get into the pew is you genuflect, okay? So um, for lots of reasons, most of which are cultural, but we still do them anyway, the church favors the right for everything. If you're left-handed, it doesn't mean you're going to hell. 
Although if you speak a romance language, you know that left is um, sinister. Um, that's in, in Italian, it's la sinistra. And so um, there's always a preference for the right. So typically you would genuflect with your right knee. Some of us can't genuflect. That's okay. So you just bow, okay? But if you can genuflect, um, let your knee hit the ground and you genuflect to the tabernacle, which is this back here. So just like in the Jewish... Um, first of all, when the Jews, and we'll talk about this next week, when the Jewish people were making their way out of slavery in Egypt and into what becomes the Holy Land, they build a tent or a tabernacle, which is the sign of God's dwelling with them, his presence with them. When they finally get to Jerusalem, they build a temple. And the temple has within it, just like the tent had within it, what was called the Holy of Holies, which had all sorts of furniture connected to it, including amazingly strong um, vigil lamp and um, what was called the Ark of the Covenant inside of which, which was a golden box, inside of which were a set of things. So it was a sign of God's presence amongst them. The tabernacle that's in a Catholic church goes directly back to the Old Testament. And the red candle is lit to tell you that inside the tabernac tabernacle is the Eucharist which we would also call the real presence of Jesus. That's not to say that he's not present anywhere else. It's to say that he's present there in a unique way. There is one day, actually two days in the year, when the, the candle is not lit and the tabernacle is empty. On those days, you don't genuflect. So th there's a red light. Anytime you walk into a Catholic church, when you see a red candle, you know that's where the Eucharist is, the Blessed Sacrament is, which as Catholics, we believe, and doesn't, you can't say this yet, perhaps, so I don't want you to, but we believe is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus, hidden under the appearance of bread. It's not bread. So out of love, just like a man gets down on his knee and proposes to the woman he's going to marry, out of love, we bend our knee to Jesus, which is exactly what Scripture says, that um, every knee on he in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth will bend the knee at the name of Jesus because he is Lord. So it's a way of reminding ourselves of that. Does that make sense? Okay. And then you sit down. And now you're ready for Mass. But ideally, I didn't design this church. Ideally, um, you wouldn't design a church like this. Because um, the, the focus of the liturgy is supposed to take you up. Because when we come into Mass, we believe we're actually, and we'll say this next week too, but we believe we're actually entering into heaven in a real way. And we get to be present there in a real way. And then we have to go out and tell people about who it is that we met, who's offered up his life for us, and who's spoken to us in the Scriptures, and who's given himself to us in the Eucharist. So our, our focus goes up. This church, it goes down. It's built like, a, it's built like an amphitheater. This is not a concert hall. This is not where performances take place. We don't stage events here. We worship God here. And so if we were to build it again, we would build it actually going that way, like going upwards, so that our eyes would be keep going up towards the altar and then up to the crucifix and then up into heaven. When you go into churches that were built, um, say, especially in Europe, you'll see there's one main aisle in the church, typically, whereas ours is built like a fan. Most churches are built, um, especially in ancient times, in the shape of a cross. So architecturally, it looks like a cross. There's a one huge aisle, and then there's another aisle that comes across this way. This main aisle is called a nave. Anybody here speak Romance languages? What do you think the root of nave is? Center? No, it's a great guess, though. It's the same. It's how we get navel, not this navel, like academy. It's a naval academy. Ship. So a nave is the Latin word for ship. 
So this is, this is not some cute little detail. It's actually really significant. So here's the point. What it's trying to say is that all of us in this life here, we're a journey. Life is a journey. And the ancients would often use um, sailing across the sea as an image for life. Like we're all heading somewhere. We're all on this voyage. Some of us know where we're going. Some of us don't. And so we're on this ship together. The church would say we're in the ship that is the boat of Peter, which is a favorite image in the Gospels. Jesus is in the boat. Sometimes he's asleep, but he's in the boat. But we're there with him. And we're, sh we're sailing somewhere. We're going somewhere. Where we're going is into heaven. That's the journey that we're headed towards, to be with the Lord one day forever, to be transformed, to share in his own divine life. And so this is supposed to be, it's not here, but it's supposed to be a visual for, hey, here we are again, brothers and sisters, on the journey, all together. We got our eyes firmly fixed on him and what he's done for us. And maybe this week the sailing was particularly rough and the seas were fierce and the winds were really bad. But we're reminded we're in the boat with the Lord and we're in it together. And he wins because that's not the end. So that's what this is supposed to represent. And then increasingly so, in most churches, there's more and more and more light as you get closer and closer into the altar. Pagan temples were very ornate on the outside, very dark and boring on the inside. When Christianity begins to be able to build churches, they were very plain on the outside and incredibly ornate on the inside. They were also huge. Pagan temples were very small. They were for the privileged few. Churches are massive. Why? Because the gospel is for everybody. It's not for those who've, you know, got some new mystical insights. No, it's for everybody. So you build huge churches that can accommodate people. With me so far? All right? That's the bowing and the... I got it. Don't worry. I'll keep this on. So that's the bowing and the genuflecting. Why a crucifix? Um, well, clearly we know Jesus is alive. Right? But if we're sensual beings... What helps you better understand God's love? To see him on it? First of all, there are, um, crucifixion was and unfortunately is again very common. It's not the cross that's significant, it's the fact that God's on it. That's what makes it significant. That's what makes it holy. That Jesus embraced it to prove his love for us and to pay the price that was mine which I could never repay. And so a cross without him on it is just a cross, which countless people endured. The cross with him on it, which allows me to see what he's done. Now, especially if you're like me anyway, I don't feel God's love oftentimes in my life. I walk out of hospitals at 3 in the morning after anointing people who are about to die who are 22 years old, and I wonder, where in the world are you, Lord? So my feelings don't always tell me that God loves me. But I can see it. I have so many crucifixes in my house that, I mean, I could build a house out of them. Because I need to see it that often. Because there are so many threats around me that can shake me or tempt me to think that he doesn't care, which is this, the devil's constant temptation. He doesn't care. He's not good. He's not listening. Just look. And so the Lord leaves me this image where I can see, oh no, he does care. I may not feel it right now, but I know it. I can see it. Right? Does that make sense? Does that help with why we have a crucifix? Let me try to walk through, and we'll get to some, as we do this, we'll get to the questions. So we begin, we all stand. Why? We all stand because the Lord is coming in. Not because I am, 
because the Lord is, and the priest actually is standing there in the person of Jesus. And no one's more bewildered by that, trust me, than a priest, okay? Because I know who I am. But um, sacramentally, just like God uses really ordinary things like bread and wine, so he uses really ordinary things like people like me to become present. And so we stand to greet the king as he comes in, who's really here. He's going to speak to us in his word, and he's going to give us himself in the Eucharist. So we stand for that. And we have an opening prayer, and then we sit down. We sit because seating or being seated is a position of just kind of reflective listening. And so it's a posture where we listen to the first reading from the Old Testament. We sing the psalm from the Old Testament. We listen to a reading from the New Testament, usually from Paul's letters, but not always. And we sit for that. We sit just to be leisurely listening. And then we stand, and we stand because the gospel, unlike the rest of the scriptures, the gospel is where the Lord speaks to us directly. He speaks to us indirectly through the prophets or Paul or Peter or John or James or Jude, but he speaks to us directly in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? So we stand for that, to be attentive to him. The de- if there is a deacon, and there's not always a deacon, the deacon comes over to me and he asks, Father, may I have your blessing? And then I place my hands on him and I, and I pray, may the Lord be in your, on your mind and on your lips and in your heart that you might worthily and well proclaim the gospel. Now I can fly through that or I can say it like I mean it. And he can bow and just pretend like he cares or he can do it like he means it. A lot of us might um, think about Catholicism or have heard about Catholicism um, thinking of Jesus' words where he rebukes people for their vain repetition. But note what he says. He doesn't say for their repetition. He says for their vain repetition. Jesus himself prayed the Psalms over and over and over and over again. He wasn't doing it vainly in an empty fashion. But he was clearly repeating himself. There's nothing wrong with repeating yourself. Most of us are just not that creative to come up with new ways of saying things all the time. It's only vain repetition that's dangerous, meaning I'm not thinking about what I'm saying. Our challenge as Catholics, and I'll acknowledge it, is to always try to be thinking about what I'm saying or what I'm doing and not just do it rotely, okay? So he asks for that blessing. While he does that, then he'll come over. We stand to be attentive to the Lord's word. He says um, what he says about the gospel, and then we do this thing, all right? So you make the sign of the cross. I trace it with my fingernail so I can feel it on my forehead, on my lips, and on my heart. And there's a couple of different things that you, would, you can do here. May the Lord be in my mind and on my lips and in my heart. Um, what I always do, the best thing I've ever heard someone say is, um, is this. This is a more, much more powerful prayer, I find. May everything that is in my thoughts, on my mouth, and in my heart, that is not gospel, may it be crucified. Well, that's not vain and rote. <laughs> so it's a way for me again to think, to acknowledge, okay, sometimes my thoughts, they need to go. <laughs> and some of the things that I say with my mouth, they don't belong. And some of the things that are in my heart, the heart's not the center of feelings in Scripture, it's the center of decision-making. Some of those things, they need to go. So that's what we do when we just do that, okay? And then after the gospel, we all sit down again. And we sit again so that we can listen reflectively to the scriptures being broken open. Okay? That's the first part of the Mass. And again, we'll say more about that next week. The second part of the Mass is focused on this, the altar. And it has to do with the sacrifice. And so our our postures take on a new uh, demeanor for that as well. And so at a certain point, we all kneel in the Mass. It's not so that we can, you know get into new postures and move the body around and get a workout while we're here. It's because as we get closer and closer to the sacrifice of Jesus made once and for all, becoming present again to us now, just like Private Ryan when he walks into Normandy, not only does a hush come over us, but a sense of reverence comes over us and we just get down on our knees. Not as slaves 
any more than a man gets on his knees as a slave in front of his wife when he proposes to her out of grateful affection. And kneeling is a posture which is over and over and over again, a posture which is encountered, especially in the New Testament. When people encounter Jesus, they kneel in front of him. We see it in the book of Revelation and what's going on in heaven. People kneel before the Lord. You may or may not be aware of this, but you're a creature. God is not a creature. God is the omnipotent Lord of heaven and earth. The fact that he even lets us come into his presence is astounding. And he doesn't want us to be slaves. He made us for friendship. He made us for love. And we express our love, again, by what we do with our bodies. Does that make sense? You get that? Okay. Then you'll see people, when they approach the altar. I'm still just going through gestures that you'll see at Mass. So we're kneeling at a certain point. We stand for the Lord's Prayer um, to prepare ourselves to, to pray together this prayer which Jesus himself taught us and then to be able to come forward to receive him in the Eucharist. So you'll see people come forward for the Eucharist. There is one correct posture actually for preparing to receive the Lord in the Eucharist and that's to bow. You'll see people here genuflect. You'll see people kneel, but um, that's not forbidden, but it's not the posture. The posture is simply to bow and then either to receive the Lord in your hands or on your tongue. For those of you who are not Catholic, um, you get two choices here, and I'll get to why it is uh, about communion. You can either stay seated, but I wouldn't encourage that, actually. I would encourage you to come forward. And to come forward, some of us did it today, and just cross your hands like this. That says, I want a blessing. So some people will come forward with their hands like this who are Catholic, but they need to go to confession. They're aware of some serious sin in their life, um, which is serious enough to keep them from receiving the Eucharist. And so they'll just ask for a blessing. And serious enough meaning it's against the commandments, first condition. Um, I knew it, second condition, and I just freely did it anyway. So when I violate the commandments, which is really easy to do if you're me, um, you shouldn't receive the Eucharist. So you'll see Catholics go like this. Um, or those who are not Catholic go like this and come forward to receive or to receive a blessing. I encourage people to come forward because I want you to get as close to Jesus as you can and to let him just create a longing in you to receive him. The reason for um, who can receive communion um, is because the Eucharist is, um, is, uh, is not a gesture of hospitality might be an odd way to say it, but that's one of the most helpful ways I know to say it. So what we do here with our bodies um, says something. It expresses a reality. So just like shaking your hand means something, it means welcome. Um, when you, in a Catholic church, and I can't speak about any other place, but I can tell you what it means in a Catholic church. When you come forward in a Catholic church to receive the the Eucharist, you're saying at least two things. You're saying, everything these people here believe, I believe. And second, you're saying, I'm in grace, meaning I'm free from what First John calls deadly sin, which is sin which meets three conditions that we just said. Seriously wrong, I knew it, freely did it anyway. Those two things, everything these people here believe, and I'm in grace, they're either true or they're not true. If they're true, receive. If they're not true, then it, this would be a lie. So rather than saying, it, 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 it in no way is like, well, you're just not good enough because you're not Catholic. Ha huh, ha, you can't have this. Um, that's not what this is about. It's about making sure that the people that us, when we come forward, we really are in a visible unity with each other and with the Lord. Does that help a little bit about communion? Yeah, so if in fact I do believe what everybody here believes, um, that should be public, which is why I should be baptized. Because you cannot be a private Christian. Because, um, so Jesus says in the Gospels, uh, 
no one lights a lamp and puts it underneath a basket. Why? Because that would be stupid. That's why. It would be nonsensical, right? So you light a lamp so that darkness can get illuminated. For us, we'd say no one turns on the lights and then covers the lights with duct tape. That would be stupid. He means a lot of things by that, but here's one of the things he means. I did not come into your life so that no one would know about it. I came into your life to shine brightly through it so that everybody that you encounter, implicitly or explicitly, doesn't matter, would know I'm alive because of you. And so you cannot be a private Christian. Okay? Does that make sense? So that's why we make such a big deal about especially the baptism of adults and then bringing people into full communion because because the unity the unity that God wants is not a tangent you know like a little tiny unity it's like big unity he wants us to be united in all things even as diverse as we are and we are obviously really diverse okay well oh, the one thing I missed was the chest bump all right so um so we, we so it seems kind of bizarre right we come into mass and one of the first things we do is we acknowledge how bad we are um, this is not because Catholics are masochists. Um, it's just because it's reality. Like, just ask the people you live with or you work with. Um, it might be newsflash to you, but um, you have issues, <laughs> right? As do I. And so it's just a, it's a gesture of humility. We just acknowledge before, before we do anything else at Mass, we call to mind, God is the all-holy one, and I ain't. And it's a good thing to be reminded that I ain't. And so we do um, this particular prayer. And in the prayer, we repeat three times, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. And once, while we do that, we strike our heart. Why? Because the heart's the center of my decision-making again. And again, because I'm a bodily person. So that's the reason behind it. Huh? It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to actually remind myself. It's a way of just ingraining into my person, oh yeah, this is true. Now again, I can do that rotely without thought or I can do it with thought. The challenge for us is to do it with thought, but that's why we do it. Let me say something quickly about these. So why do we have statues? Because there's a commandment about making graven images. Um, there's also a command given by God to make a graven image. So the commandment clearly can't be um, universal. God tells Moses, for example, um, to make a golden serpent or a bronze serpent and to mount it on a pole. Okay? Graven just means carved. So the same God who says, don't make a graven image of me or of anything also tells Moses, make a graven image. So what do you do when you got two things? You're trying to understand why does he say this? We'll get to that when we do a little discussion on the commandments. But this, the point is just to say the same God who says, don't make graven images, says, make a graven image. He also commands other images to be made at other times in the Old Testament. So there's nothing wrong with images. The church, back in the 8th century, definitively answered the question, can we do can we make graven images or can we carve images? And the ultimate reason behind it was the fact that God himself took flesh and gave us an image of himself. And in doing so, he forever changed revelation. So Jesus is the image of the invisible God. To see him is to see God. Okay? So flowing from the principle of the fact that God himself has taken an image for himself and communicated to us, the church back in the 8th century began to, or not began to, it definitively answered the question about images. So, who are these? That's Mary, as in the mother of Jesus. This is John, who's um, one of the first four disciples of Jesus. So, John, that's his brother James, and then the first statue over here is Joseph. That's the husband of Mary. And then the two brothers over there are Peter and Andrew. Andrew, Peter, 
John and James had a fishing co-op together. They were business partners. Um, they worked together. They're amongst the first four that Jesus calls. So that's who those are. That's Matthew, another one of the apostles. This woman is um, Therese of Lisieux. She was a young French girl who was a, uh, a Carmelite. That's the name of a religious community. So she lived in France, um, dies at a very young age. Um, I don't want to get lost in her details. She's an amazing person to ask to pray with. This is St. Mary Magdalene, who um, gets a lot of different descriptions from people. The only thing that we know for certain about Mary Magdalene is that she had seven demons. She was a messed up woman. Um, she was, she's the first witness to the resurrection. She's known as the apostle to the apostles. She was not Jesus' wife, despite what Dan Brown might think. Um, this is St. Monica. So Monica is the um, mother of a man named St. Augustine, who might be familiar to some of us. Augustine's one of the greatest persons who ever lived in human history. Um, one of the most prolific authors in human history. His first 33 years were uh, spent in a, in a relentless search for truth and for beauty. His mother was a very devout Christian for all his life. She prayed for his conversion. He finally converts and comes on to become one of the greatest um, of uh, Christians. Um, so she's here. Anytime you cross the tabernacle, you genuflect. That's why I just did that. This is a woman named St. Faustina. Faustina was uh, um, a Polish woman who dies in the 1930s. Um, some of us might have heard of what's called the Divine Mercy um, chaplet or devotion that really flows in a particular way from Faustina. Um, there's lots more we can say about her too. This is St. Thomas, another one of the apostles. Thomas has his finger out because Thomas is the one on Easter Sunday when the disciples say, we've seen Jesus. He says, I don't believe it. I'll believe it when I put my finger into the hole in his side and my finger into his hands and my finger into the nail marks in his feet. So that's why his finger's out. Um, it's worth noting Thomas was a twin. So Thomas deserves some slack because Thomas, if you're a twin, was often confused with being his brother. And I don't mean that to be flip. I mean that to be true. Um, this here is St. Paul, uh, the apostle to the Gentiles, um, who himself hated Christians until he encountered Jesus after Jesus had um, already risen from the dead. And then we mentioned Andrew and Peter and Joseph. So those are the saints. Uh, there are other saints back behind the sanctuary. And the other saints back there are all men and women who served in one capacity or another in our country. It's a way of reminding us that saints didn't just live a long time ago in other places. They live here. And in fact, if you don't become a saint, you failed life. What's that? It's a really low bar. Yeah. Because... Um, because when, not if, when you die, you're going to stand face to face in front of God. And he's going to judge you. We're saved by grace. I'm judged by my works. Saved by grace. I didn't earn that. But Jesus makes it abundantly clear in the Gospels that when I die, books will be opened. And I will be judged according to my life and what I've done. Thankfully, one of the things I can do is repent. Say, I'm sorry. Ask forgiveness. And so, um, when you die, when you die, God's going to say one of two things. He's either going to say, depart from me, which you don't want to hear, and I don't want to hear. Or he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Wait till you see what I have waiting for you. And if he says, well done, then you're a saint. So you either become a saint or you are a complete and utter loser. All right? God's desire is that no one would be an utter loser because his desire is that everybody would get home. Okay? That's the statues. Does that make sense to folks? Yeah? The relics, let me just, um, relics are bizarre to a lot of people, but they're actually, so a simple way to think of it, um, anybody here like sports memorabilia or war memorabilia or people have like all sorts of collections in their houses at times. I've seen people with stones from all over significant places 
in the world. I've got, you know, my brother and I used to have all sorts of baseball cards and baseball jerseys from all sorts of guys who played all throughout um, history, right? So why do we have that? We have, I have things from my dad who's gone now that I love to have. Why? Because I love my dad. And it's a tangible reminder of my dad, right? So this is what we do as human beings. Like, that was my brother's penguin. I want it, all right? Because my brother loved penguins, and it reminds me of my brother's life. So it might sound really stupid to you, but it doesn't sound stupid to me. So it's a touch of him. The saints are our family. So to have things from our family members, it means something. Now, what we have are not like hats and penguins. We have bones, which is a little weird, all right? If you have remains of your family members in your house, you should not. They should be buried. Don't, don't put grandma on the mantle, okay? Please, um, don't put grandma on the mantle. Um, she deserves to be buried so that people can visit her and because that's what should happen. So if that's the case, why do we have these here? These are here to venerate, not to worship, to venerate, to acknowledge. And the roots of that just comes right out of the scriptures. Whether it's in the New Testament when you'll see handkerchiefs being brought to, um, to Peter to touch him or to Paul to touch him and then take back to the sick or whether it's people standing in the streets hoping that the shadow of Peter would fall on them as they walk by or whether it's someone being thrown into a grave in the Old Testament of a holy man who comes to life because he touched the bones of a man who was a holy man. So some of us may not be, from, especially if we're um, coming from other Christian traditions, we may not be familiar with those passages, but they're in the scriptures. It's just a continuity of what it is that God had revealed all throughout um, salvation history. So we have relics here to not only remind us of the people who lived great lives, but to ask their intercession for us because um, the saints aren't dead. They're alive. And that's why we have the saints in the formation, if you will, that they are. Because when we walk into church, what we've walked into, as I said earlier, is heaven. It's clearly not heaven in its entirety. But we get a taste of it. Which means we walk into the worship of those who are there. And all these people, like, my favorite image is, um, it's like being in a stadium and we're on the field. And they're in the stands. They were once on the field, but they already won. And now they're in the stands and they're not watching us, they're cheering us on. And so they surround us in here to remind us that, that they're there, they're for us, they're praying for us. That's the scriptural image. And that one day we get to join them to be with the Lord, but we can't join them yet. So that's why they're there. Does that make sense? Yeah, we're going to say a lot more about that later on. So pray, yeah, when we use the word pray, most people use the word pray and they exclusively mean it as um, worship. Catholics can get careless with that word. I don't mean that in a flippant way. Um, we can use that word to mean a lot of things, and in its most basic sense, it means talk to. So if by pray you mean worship, we only worship God. We don't worship anybody else. We don't worship Mary. We don't worship the saints. But we talk to them. So if I'm sick and I ask you to pray for me, and you say, no, and we go, wow, that was a really loving thing to do. Um, so people who care about each other, if we ask one another to pray for each other, we go, of course I'll pray for you. What's going on? We, you know, the, re the response wouldn't be, no, just go to Jesus. He'll take care of that. Yeah, I know he will, but I thought you, thought you loved me. I thought maybe you'd show some compassion or kindness, you know, and right now I need someone to pray with me. So in the same way that we would ask people who are here to pray for us, we ask people who are there to pray for us because in heaven you do what you do on earth. You love God and you love your neighbor. And we're their neighbor in addition to the people who are there. Does that help? All right. Um, one of the other th questions uh, with regards to saints, at the end of Mass, um, we pray here after Mass is over a prayer which is uh, somewhat of a new prayer in church history. It's only uh, a little bit more than 100 years old, and it's the prayer of St. Michael. So it's projected on the walls for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, has 
somewhat of a um, dramatic history to it, but it, it, the short version is something like this. Um, Pope Leo XIII, who was the Holy Father um, back in, towards the end of the 19th century, was coming out of Mass one day. He's in the Vatican, and he has a, um, it gets told a couple of different ways. He either has a vision or he hears something. And he's just, as he's leaving Mass, he stops, and he's just kind of transfixed for a set of minutes, doesn't move, finally gets up, goes in, takes off his vestments, and someone says, what was up with that? And he described a conversation that he had between, um, or that he heard between two voices, one which was, um, he described as harsh and guttural, which he discerned was Satan, and the other was the voice uh, which was gentle and warm, which he discerned as God's. And the conversation went something like this, I will destroy the church. And the other voice said, Something like, really? And Satan asked for time to do it. And the Lord granted him time and then said, if I remember something to the effect of, if at the end of that time you have not been able to do what you say you will do, I will undo all of your works. Anecdotally, the last hundred years have been arguably amongst the worst in human history with regards to simple number of deaths, whether it's World War I, II, the abortion holocaust, Pol Pot in the killing fields, Stalin, you name it, China and their forced abortions. So Leo XIII wrote the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel because um, Michael is Satan's rival, not Jesus because Michael and Satan, who was Lucifer, were both angels. So Satan, and we'll talk a lot about this to come, Satan is not a good, you know, like, he's not a bad God. It's not like bad God, good God. There's just one God, and Satan ain't God. He's a creature, an angelic creature, but he's a creature. And so his rival is that prince of the heavenly host, that's Michael. When you read Revelation, you see Michael's the one who goes to war, against Satan and the fallen angels. So that's why we pray the prayer of St. Michael the Archangel. It used to be prayed in every church after Mass, and then it was stopped in the 60s and 70s. Um, we pray it here because of the. Um, uh, it's a way to remind people of the reality of evil and the reality that the devil is real and that he has one goal, that's to keep you from getting to heaven. And um, so we ask the intercession of Michael to pray for us. That's why we do it. But we'll talk a lot more about that as we go on, okay? We ring bells um, because um, the, the, there was a time, and there still is a time. So, like, if you come to Mass here on a Wednesday night, I'll celebrate Mass standing here. And we'll all be looking that way. So, sometimes you'll hear people say... Um, the priest had his back to us. But I'm not turning my back to you when I do that. What I'm, what I'm trying to do is we're all trying to look the same direction and we're trying to be oriented to the Lord and to the cross. Um, in every church except for St. Peter's in Rome, up until not too long ago, um, Mass was celebrated that way and it was every church was built facing east. That's what ad oriens means because the sun rises from the east, which is a symbol of the resurrection, over and over again. So sometimes I'll cel we'll celebrate Mass every Wednesday, actually, we celebrate Mass this way. When, when we're all looking in the same direction, it's hard to see what's happening at the altar. Because of that, bells are rung. The bells are rung when um, we ask the Holy Spirit to descend upon the bread and wine. The bells are rung when we hold up the host. The bells are rung when we hold up the chalice, and then the bells are rung when the priest receives communion. So it's not like I'm supposed to tune out the rest of the Mass and only tune up when I hear the bells, but it's a way to call my attention to what's happening at the altar. Music. Um, we actually have a lot of diversity in our... If you ever come to 5 o'clock, the music's really different. You'll hear... Um, you might hear drums, you might hear string guitars, or... Uh, 
um, acoustic guitars, you might hear electric guitars, you might hear piano, organ. So um, worship is diverse. Some churches limit itself to an organ. Some places limit themselves to a piano. Um, we want to be somewhat hard to box in. So not so that we can be unique and different, but because um, I think we're supposed to bring out of the storehouse both the new and the old as we worship God. So that's why we do that. What I missed that you asked. How wide is Mass so long? There's no reason that Mass is a particular length. Um, um, mass is over when it's over. So no one walks out of a great movie and goes, gosh, that was so dang long. Right? You walk out of a bad movie and say that. Um, but it, I would argue if once we really understand what's happening here, and we'll talk about this next week, you can spend all day here. And until I understand that, I'm watching something. But to come to Mass is not to be a spectator. I'm not supposed to come to Mass to watch something. I'm supposed to come to, match, to Mass to enter into the action and the prayer. And that's going to be what we talk about next week. Okay? That help? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so one of the, um, so the comment is just in some churches, there's a lot, it worships a lot more lively, and in Catholic churches, it seems to be more reserved. Um, a couple reasons for that. One would be that uh, our worship isn't limited to Mass. So we do praise and worship here once a month. Um, on Wednesday nights, it's going to start, we, we kind of take a break during the summer. Um, it'll start back up in October, and on those nights, um, it's not hymns. So we turn off all the lights, we fill this place with candles, um, and we have a lot of worship. Um, so you, you might see a different Catholic church than you've heard of if you come to that. So the Mass is kind of a ritualized play. What we do when we come together for Mass um, has a rhythm to it and a reason behind it. And I'll say a lot more about that next week. That's why... Um, most places, not all places, but most places, the music um, is supposed to, is worshipful, but it's supposed to complement and augment what's happening on the altar, as opposed to be the focal point. Take the Eucharist away from Mass, and we don't have anything. We only have preaching and music, and so then you really need lively music put the Eucharist in the center of it, and now everything goes around it and is supposed to help me understand what's happening in the celebration of the Eucharist as opposed to take my attention away from it. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Great question. Okay. Yeah, so uh, the question is, do I have to be baptized Catholic to receive the Eucharist? No, but you have to be in full communion with the church. So if you were baptized already, not Catholic, but it was with water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, if you remember last week, I said we would recognize that as valid. But then to come into full communion with the church, we would confirm you. And then you will receive the Eucharist. That's what happens here at the Easter Vigil, which is where this all goes towards. Okay. All right. And I know those are really uncomfortable pews, so I'm not trying to keep you there, but um, I've sat in them once in a while. Yeah. The box. Those are relics, too. So um, there's a, a verse in um, the book of Revelation, which is the last book of the Bible, which is through and through a liturgical book. You see altars, vestments, incense, worship. Um, it's a really liturgical book, as hard as it is to read. And at one point... I don't remember if it's Revelation 5 or 6. Tom might remember, or maybe John, somebody might. But um, it talks about the prayers of the saints coming from under the altar. 
So when Christian churches are first being built, they would always build the church on top of the remains of a martyr or the grave of a martyr. Because a martyr is someone whose life was taken from them. Not, that's a big difference between Catholics and others. Um, some would look at a martyr as somebody who, who dies, perhaps killing other people. Um, a martyr is just the Greek word witness. It's somebody whose life is taken from them, refuses to renounce Jesus. So the martyrs are those who are most closely conformed to Jesus because they not only have their life taken from them, but they die praying for those who take their lives, which is pretty amazing. So early churches were always built on top of the graves of the altars because of a martyr, on top of the grave of a martyr, because the martyr most exemplified Jesus in this life. And so they were always um, um, rectangular because it was built on top of the whole body. That's why we have the relics under the altar. When you stopped building them on top of an actual body, the altar shape changed and it became square. But you'll still see churches where the altar is laying on top of a body and the altar there is rectangular because the body's underneath it. So there's more relics down there. We, we put different saints in and out of there at different times. So, And then sometimes you'll see me I have a, a, a small crucifix that I put on top of the altar. I didn't have it today, but it's black. Um, and I put it on top of the altar because inside, that's a reliquary, so it has a relic inside it. The relic that's inside it is a relic of the true cross, which it's not true that if you put all the relics of the true cross together, you could build a skyscraper. Um, we actually, um, the church has records of every single relic that we have. Um, and we know where all the relics of the true cross are. Um, so I have like a little sliver of it that was given to me years ago by somebody. I don't even know who. And so I put it on the altar um, as a reminder of um, just what it is that Jesus has done. Okay? Great. Yeah. Last one. Got to make it a great one. No pressure. Can I touch on... Adoration. Um, how about, it, that's actually a great question to come up next week because it flows directly from the Mass. Um, so why it is that Catholics might, what I call, waste time with Jesus and the Eucharist, which I mean in a very positive way. I think it's the best way to describe prayer. Prayer is wasting time with God. Not because it is a waste of time, but because time is so precious for all of us, and I don't waste it with just anybody. I waste it with the people who mean the most to me. So I love wasting time with people I really love, um, and I love to waste time with God. That's why I call it that. So we'll talk about that next week, okay?